Well, hello and a warm welcome back to the Andrew Eborn Show, a jacketless Andrew Eborn, to welcome the radio lord himself. How are you, Mike? I'm good. Your jacket has been ripped off by adoring fans. Hey, oh, I love it. Doreen fans is one of my neighbours. It's always a joy. Lovely woman. It's always a thrill. Yes, I thought it's, a, it's summer, you see. You don't always, no jacket required, as my old mate Phil Collins would say. Well, yes, I remember at one of the Nordoff Robbins lunches um, when it was very hot. And who was the guest? I think it's Princess Michael of Kent. And we were all on the table and Phil Collins was on the table. And I did make that joke because everyone was perspiring. And she said, well, you may take your jackets off. So I said, no jacket required, which of course Phil Collins got his that. And I don't think she did get. Uh, so for her, it was just a comment, no jacket required. She didn't get the, yeah, very good, very good. I see no yeah. messing there. Well, there's also there's a restaurant. I, I, there's a wonderful restaurant in in Soho, near Soho, um, very close to the Ivy, called Beaujolais, and they have ties. If only goes in with a tie, trying to look suitably impressive for a for a business meeting or for a date or whatever. They take the tie and they hang it up so you, nobody can reach it again. If you go in, you'll see there's a whole sort of forest dangling down of people's ties, uh, which I think is glorious as well. I love it. I mean, yes, the, the the opposite to the Connaught or or Browns or somewhere where they always insisted, not the Connaught so much now, but the Connaught Browns always insisted on ties. Always. Yeah. So the RAF club, for example, you have and the RAC club, you have to wear a jacket. And if you go along without one, uh, they will lend one to you and uh, they, they don't always necessarily fit. So it's quite a squeeze sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, the, the RAF will probably give you, uh, when I've been in, they give you a tie that doesn't go with anything you've got on at all, so you don't forget the next time. Yeah, always a joy. Well, tell us, I mean, talk about extraordinary links and things like that. Tell us about today's inspiration for your poem. Uh, yeah, it was National Chocolate Eclair Day, and I thought, oh, I could write about chocolate eclairs. And then that led me to thinking, uh, about Lord Berners, who once famously encouraged by Salvador Dali, uh, took his grand chocolate declares and began playing. Um, now that is, it's a, you know, eccentricity to the nth, I think that. So, uh, and there were other very eccentric things he did that I remembered. And I thought, I'll do a, I'll do a poem uh, on that. Uh, I'll, I won't mention the title because it's also the punchline. Okay, okay. So it's over to you, Radio Laureate, to tell us all about it. Lord Berners was a true eccentric, I guess. Once he advertised in the press, Lord Berners wished to dispose of two creatures with a long nose, abrasive elephants, now an irrelevance, so they can each take their trunk and do a bunk. And also, I know it sounds preposterous, one small rhinoceros. And he went to great pains to say it was house trained. Salvador Dali came to stay, and with Berners in cahoots, decided to wear a diver's suit to give a declamation and make a proclamation that he would try it out in front of the locals, who were pretty vocal. The diver's suit was in good condition when Dali wore it for the Surrealist exhibition. To what depths do you intend to go, quip Lord B? To the depths of subconscious, replied Salvador D. During the talk, he was in despair rapidly running out of air. Dali started to panic, and everyone thought it was part of his manic manner. But no, Berners had to fetch a spanner and a hammer and release him just in time, but the audience thought it was part of the pantomime. It wasn't just people in the house, of course. Lady Betchimud would ride her very well-groomed horse into the dining room for afternoon tea. Maybe eccentricity. His ideas were intriguing. To give you the gist, he'd trust someone frivolous more than a philanthropist. He'd put up crazy notices like mangling down here and no dogs admitted past the top of the stair. Berners was eccentric. Berners was odd. Inside his wardrobe was a sign, prepare to meet thy God. The vicar once asked him for money in Terralia and he said he was brought up not to be associated with failure. Lord Berners enjoyed silliness, possessed eccentricities miscellaneous, spoke in non sequiturs and of things extraneous. His sidekick, Robert Heber Percy, was youthful and energetic and helped him to run this bolt hole for the eccentric and aesthetic. Between Percy and Berners was a flame, the love that dare not speak its name, and Heber Percy's madness knew no bounds. He'd get naked and run around the grounds. 
Dali once waved his surrealist wand and suggested that Berners put his grand piano in the ornamental pond. He could not resist these dares and took a few dozen chocolate eclairs, placed them on the black notes and began to play a tune. I'm not sure that it wasn't a Claire de Lune. Hey, <laughs> I love it. Uh, Debussy turning in his grave. It's got to be a Claire de Lune. And actually, there is a place. I, I went to Calgary once, which I, I thought was a glorious pub. Uh, there is a, a place called a Claire de Lune uh, in Calgary. Really? In Canada. Extraordinary. Uh, so I I, I, you, you and I, like, we like our puns, don't we? I like a bit, of a, a bit of a third form pun doesn't go amiss sometimes, and, yeah. And a pun with a bun can't go far wrong, you know. It's got to be a thrill. Very current. I mean, it's always a thrill. Uh, Mike Green, thank you so much for joining us. Eccentrically yours.